for use of generative AI in enterprises, right? So a lot of enterprises have banned tools like ChatGPT, and the reason for that is they don't want their users, their employees, to be sending source code to open AI. Hallucinations in the AI world, right? Uh, normally, when you do a Google search, right, Google gives you a bunch of articles. You know that some of them can be trusted. Actually, none of them possibly can be trusted. Some one article may say left, another article might say right. So it's you know you use your judgment to judge. With the generated AI, everybody is like, no, let's go, let's hire, let's do something. But then they do not really know what to do and how to control when they do this. So that that's what we are thinking. Yes, and they are, uh, a closed model is not going to be the differentiator there. It's going to be open sourced and what will matter is the features that you build, how well those features work, and what's your, how, how responsibly are you using those features. And to me it's like the way you would use Linux or a container or any open source component to build an application to solve a problem is going to be the same thing with models and a couple of things. About three or four people pulled here in Dakota um, and uh, built into the workflow, they built a flex around it, they built, uh, you know, connected to the user research, so on. Uh, and I would think that, you know, most companies here must be accessible to the whole company. Turned out not to be true. The access control that people use in Jira, pro level, column level, all sorts of different things, has an expectation that's, that's respected. And so it's forced a certain pattern of how data degrees is formed. It's pretty crazy to see, you know, how far ahead we are thinking about a data center as a computer. But my first AI system was in 1983 uh, at the University of Birmingham. This is an article, it's actually not 30 days old, it's actually 30 years old. Uh, I was still talking about it, my prediction in 30 years' time will probably still have the same, uh, the same cover. Um, and I teach longevity science courses, uh, some of these are for Stanford students. Aging directly. When we study processes that are very, very fundamental to how um, a cell functions, and this is what I was, uh, was reading out, I was reading out some terms that uh, uh, I, was, I was smiling because those are terms from my website, and they were written for biologists. <laughs> and so I would, I would try to re-say re, re those terms for non-biologists. So, the, although the, the notion and science of longevity was not born by us observing jellyfish or hydra or, 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 or uh, Lots of that matter. It's if I structure, there are really four categories in my textbook. One is longevity, which depends on obviously genetics, lifestyle, and environment. And genetics genes like APOE and FOXO3 and something called the, the DNA 1578, by which Japanese people live very long. Again, I'm oversimplifying, it's a first order approximation. So, genetics, lifestyle, and what? The hallmarks of intelligence. Okay, so discrepancy between the expected moment and the actual moment. We can. Let me, uh, I have one uh, little demo slide to explain this idea. So here, what we're going to do is, so these were experiments which were done in COVID, and my student, his name is Ashish Kumar, he is from IIT Jodhpur, I don't know if there's anyone here from IIT Jodhpur. But, uh, so what he did was, he did this experiment where he's got this mattress and he's pouring olive oil on it, and he's going to try to make the robot walk. Okay, in fact, he has the robot has plastic uh, socks, so it makes it extra hard. So he tries to walk, Okay, so note in slow mode. From our lab, which is uh, walking in some, uh, this is some area near Berkeley. This is also, yeah, yeah, thank you. So this robot is in the now it's in downstairs. By the way, this robot is blind, but much harder to have the skills of a one year old. Thinker has this great line. The hard problems are easy and the easy problems are hard. Chess is easy. Go is easy. 
Even language is not that hard, as we know now. It is the stuff that a 12-year-old kid can do, or even a 5-year-old before they go to school can do, which we are having trouble. <laughs> I really enjoyed the talk which uh, Jensen Hong gave and uh, I must admit that I probably understood only around 5 to 10 percent of it and uh, what it made me feel was uh, what I felt after it. I felt incredibly foolish. Do you like the energy here? Yeah, it's awesome. Uh, I get to meet a lot of people and it's good networking here. So, hello Jay, the man of the hour. Let's find out from him what He's doing here at IIT Bay Area Leadership Conference and what Mootrainer is all about. Yes, yeah, so I think uh, uh, this is my home, uh, right? I'm in IITN and this is an amazing thing happened here. Uh, you see almost over 1,000 people. Uh, I'll say majority of them are IITNs. It's just a great uh, place to mingle with your old buddies, um, networking. Uh, people are just uh, sharing ideas, most new things are happening. There are a lot of great sessions on generative AI and so. Here at IIT Bay Area Leadership Conference, how are you feeling today? I'm feeling really good and excited to meet so many wonderful people over here, including you. <laughs> Thank you. So yeah, Shubham, uh, did you attend uh, Jensen Yuan's talk in the morning? Yeah. What were your thoughts on the keynote? I think I really like this dialogue about aspiration, desperation and inspiration being the source of all the innovations in India. So Shobna, tell us how you're feeling today. It's been a great day so far, a uh, really nice conference, very well organized and my highlight for the day was uh, the keynote by uh, NVIDIA CEO Jensen and uh, he gave a very inspiring talk so I'm sure it's recorded so we'll encourage everyone to watch it Yeah. and uh, it's been great to you know, meet people and uh, reconnect with our friends. Yeah,